I just see it uh, as a beginning. Uh, not just this flight, but in this program, which has really been a very short piece of human history. An instant in history. What was once a global competition has long since become a global collaboration. And by 2025, we expect new spacecraft designed for long journeys to allow us to begin the first ever crewed missions beyond the moon into deep space. Hi there, welcome to Andaz. Andaz is an inspirational talk show brought to you from the United States. And every week we have a brand new topic and great new fabulous guests. This week, we're going to expand your mind and delve into a world that you could never imagine. We are headed to space. Well, next, this segment is going to blow you away. We all headed over to Mojave Desert and went to the actual space station of Virgin Galactic and x -Corps, and we learned all about space tourism. Well, now they have a spaceship that's headed to space, and you can buy a ticket on there, too. Let's go see how it's going to change our world. Hi, George. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Well, I'm excited to be here at the actual space station of Virgin Galactic. I mean, this is so exciting, what's happening in space tourism and how it's changing our world. Let's start off with how is the space tourism going to change our perspective in the world? What you hear when you talk to astronauts who come back from space is that they say that the experience of being up in space looking down at our planet really changes their worldview. They realize that they're, they're, we're all sort of connected and we're part of this uh, common spaceship and we sort of need to take care of it. So I'm very inspired about the idea of having you know, hundreds and eventually thousands of world leaders coming up with us to space and then returning to those communities and sharing the things that they've learned and, and the way that their uh, worldview has been transformed. How is space tourism going to change our economy and what, what is it going to do for those of us who can't go up to space? Well, I think um, space tourism is going to be a great business. Um, uh, we've already got about 570 people signed up, so it's $100 million of business just waiting to fly, and, and I think that's just really the tip of the iceberg. Let's go through from the process for those of our viewers who know nothing about space tourism. Like from buying a ticket, what you have to go through, what you can expect, and then when you return, what happens? Getting a ticket is really easy. All you have to do is just give us a call and uh, you know you can put down a deposit, it's, it's refundable and, and you get your spot in line, right? So the way it works with us is the, the more you put down, the, the sooner you get to fly. What happens when you get up there? What do you do when you get up there? Well, um, that's really up to you. Some people will want to just spend their time in space looking out the window and, and gazing down on planet Earth. Other people may be more adventurous. They may want to do like tricks or something. So they'll be, you know, spinning around the cabin or something like that. Or, you know, they're, they're, you could throw things to each other or whatever. And other people may want to um, look outward to the Milky Way and look at, you know, the incredible sky and all that. So. And what do you think this is going to do to for the perspective on religion or spirituality with people when they get up there? I mean, it is viewing the universe from a different perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Profound experiences can affect people in different ways, but ultimately my hope is that it does sort of inspire them to be um, better people and, and, uh, and, and bring them closer to humanity. Absolutely, and want to do something for the greater good of the world as opposed to just perhaps their little community. Yeah, absolutely. One last question, what are you gonna do when you get up there? Have you planned it? Well, uh, you know, I'm hoping to go up with my wife and so maybe yeah. we'll just uh, have a smooch and look out the window or something. Aww, that yeah. is so sweet. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks. Three, two, one. Hi, well, this is really cool. I'm here with Jeff, the CEO of x -Corps at Mojave Space Station, and we are inside the mock-up spacecraft. Yes. That's going to take off to space sometime at the end of the year. That's what we're working towards. So when you're up there, 
I mean, you're not necessarily going to float around or anything. So this is basically you're, you're not going to unstrap. I mean, you'll feel right. your arms floating. And you will and you you'll can, get the sensation. You, you'll, you can you play with small objects oh, and see that they're yeah. that they're uh, that you're in zero gravity. But there's not enough room in here, obviously, to do somersaults. No, but you can. But you'll get the whole experience, and it's open. It's very much the glass top spaceship. The the you are you are completely surrounded by transparency. You're floating around in zero gravity of about three minutes to do that. That's that's phenomenal. We have some guests here that are in love with space and dying to talk to you to ask you some questions. Well, let's go meet them. So, well, yes, let's head down and meet them. Well, Jeff, now we're here with mm -hmm. Wendy and Jenna. Nice meeting you. And they love space, and so they were dying to talk to you. You came so, to the right place. <laughs> so I'm just gonna let them jump right in and ask you what they wanna ask you. By all means. Mm -hmm. Did you ever imagine you'd be doing this when you were a little boy? I imagined that I would go to space and be working in space. I never thought I'd have to build my own ride. Did you always imagine yourself now you're becoming a leader in the field? Never. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to go. Mm, uh, I was fascinated by all the things we could do in space after we got there, and that's still what interests me. We're not in it because we think rockets are cool. We're in it because we think space is important, and the rocket's just what we need to get there. I definitely want a ticket to space. And when I get out there to space, I hope I'm just like George, and I'm there with my loved one, and we're enjoying our honeymoon. Well, you heard earlier from Naveen Jain. Well, he has founded a company that is actually traveling to space to mine the moon for resources and bring them back to Earth. Can you imagine that? So we all thought the world was short of resources, but actually it's not, because we can now travel to other planets and bring resources back from there. Let's go see how it's done. Moon Express. How did you come up with this concept? Well, the idea is that each one of us from our childhood have this romantic image of a moon. And we all dream about, uh, you know, looking at the moon and thinking, what could be out there? So moon has been explored from a scientific perspective, but a moon has never been explored from an entrepreneurial perspective. How is your small team going to get to the moon and mine it for resources? This is about the relative size of our moon to Earth. But what's really, really astounding is how far the moon is from Earth. The moon is this far away. There's nothing new about getting to the moon. It's about doing it in an entrepreneurial way, applying innovation and disruptive technologies so small teams can do what only superpowers could do before. The moon is nothing but another, another continent of planet Earth. So why not use the moon as the eighth continent and find the resources and bring them back to Earth to make humanity's lot better. So if we're now mining other planets for resources, I mean, what is that going to do for our economy here? I mean, what do you foresee? The moon is like a Rosetta Stone. It has the secrets of the entire history of the solar system built into it because its surface has, unlike the Earth, it doesn't have an atmosphere. All of the rocks, all of the asteroids, and all of the events of the solar system are written in the memory of the moon. And all those asteroids are bringing the platinum, the rare earth elements, plus you have helium-3. So helium-3 is a very special element that essentially you can use for fusion energy in a small amount of helium-3 could provide energy for the whole planet for hundreds of years. So once this lender gets to the moon, is it going to hover around looking for resources? Then what happens? So the robotic lander is going to first land safely and we're going to check things out. We're going to look around the surface to see what's interesting. And then little robots are going to fly off of our major lander and go, go exploring on the moon. Well, the challenge of landing on the moon is that first you have to travel the enormous distance from the Earth to the moon. But the biggest challenge is there's no atmosphere on the moon. So you have to turn around the spacecraft and you actually have to slow down. You don't have atmosphere. You don't have parachutes, all you have is rockets. And that's a quarter million miles away. It's like threading a needle on the other side of the planet. And then how do you plan on making this a business? What is your model? The model is really simple. That everything that we need on Earth is in plentiful on Moon. 
we can bring these resources back on earth. And I believe there is a substantially good business. So it is not just a fun project, it is also a great business. Andaz, brought to you by Basic Ayurveda, your source for Ayurvedic juices. Piatek Institute, the art of medicine, the science of weight loss. Worried about your neighbors or who your child is spending time with or perhaps who your daughter is dating? Get your free Intellius background check from AndazTV.com. Andaz, brought to you by Gehi and Associates, for all your immigration matters. Silk Threads, the name says it all. Thank you, Naveen and Bob. I just think it's so cool how instead of bringing people to the moon, you're bringing the moon to us. Well, have you ever wondered what gravity does to our bodies and how we can make sure that we can reverse those effects? Well, we talk to our favorite weight loss doctor, Jay Piatek, and he gives us his tip of the week. Sure, Sarka. Gravity does take its toll, and what it does is it starts weighing us down. Girls start out with an hourglass figure. When they hit menopause, they get this pooch. Men start out with a 30-inch waist. By the time I get them, they have 40-inch waists. Why it goes to the belly is because our hormones drop. Testosterone drops with age, growth hormone drops with age, and then the bad hormones go up, and that makes us fatter. And it's a risk for heart disease and other issues. And so what I do is I optimize their levels by giving them testosterone at the right dose, whatever a girl needs or whatever a guy needs. And we can see that their bellies can go down and they can start having a better effect and fighting gravity, so to speak. Well, have you all ever wondered if there's life outside of Earth? I mean, how could there not be? The universe is so large and expansive and there's so much that we don't know. Well, millions and millions and millions of people around the world for centuries have seen unidentified flying objects. What does it mean? Well, we're gonna hear from Dr. Lin and Wendy Piatek about their sightings. Let's go take a look. a lot of people are looking up is because of a mystery in the sky. Is it a balloon, a UFO? Whatever it is, it sure has a lot of people talking. I came into all of this as a healthy skeptic. I had no background, no knowledge, no interest in this topic at all until my husband, who's also a physician, and I had a very close sighting to our home. right outside our bedroom window of three amber orbs in a pyramid formation, one on top and two closely aligned underneath. It was extraordinary. And it was something that I never even would imagine was here on Earth and immediately tried to take everything in. Uh, the shape, the color, the, um, the size, they were about three to six feet each. They were oval shaped like an egg on its side. There were three distinct objects and I call them an orb because the light did not extend outside the edge. It was self-contained. It was very, very different than anything I'd ever seen. While I'm looking intently at these orbs, I'm thinking, if I don't get a picture of this, no one's gonna believe it. We saw this up close and personal and that top orb started to dim very, very, very slowly as if it was imploding from the outside inwards. After it disappeared, it still felt like it was there. My very first experience with UFOs, I was in the back of my building that I own in downtown Indianapolis. And my niece and I were working very late at night and we happened to take a break and we were in my back parking lot. And I looked up and I was um, noticing a really bright star. But I was kidding with my niece and I said, you know, that's a UFO. And I, I knew nothing about UFOs at the time. We just kind of laughed about it and went on. And then about 20 minutes later, my niece said, look how far it's moved. We, you know, we thought it was earth rotation. And then suddenly it fell, which had to be thousands of feet, and then went back up to be a beautiful planet or star. You know, when they first started, they were, they were absolutely terrifying to me. And we had numerous experiences. I continued photographing them up until and including March 13th, 1997, when thousands of people statewide were looking up at the sky, very clear sky, for a glimpse of the Hale-Bopp comet, 
when they also caught a glimpse of a mile to two mile wide in some very, very credible reports. In science, we look for repeatability, and over and over and over again, it shows that these phenomena are popping up right where South Mountain and the Estrellas intersect. And in the basin in between those two mountain ranges is the Gila Bend Indian Reservation. These phenomena keep popping up there. I asked them, I called and said, did you see any strange lights on March 13th, 1997? And they started to giggle. And I said, is that funny? And they said, are you kidding? We've been looking up at them for centuries, not only on March 13th, we call them sky people, light beings, it's part of their culture. And if we could put all these puzzle pieces together so that the day that they do present themselves, and they will, that we're not so scared, that we can say, you know what, here's the information, here's what we know for sure, and here's how we should behave. And um, I think that's a very important thing to do at this point. Brought to you by Jocks, core support shorts, reduce back pain, and get active. Basic Ayurveda, your source for Ayurvedic juices. Piatek Institute, the art of medicine, the science of weight loss. Worried about your neighbors or who your child is spending time with? Or perhaps who your daughter is dating? Get your free Intellius background check from AndazTV.com. Andaz, brought to you by Silk Threads, the name says it all. Well, have you ever wondered what it's like to fly up into space? Or did you daydream about being an astronaut when you were a kid? Well, we talked to astronaut Dan Barry. He has actually traveled to space three times. He's gonna give us his perspective on what he saw and how he did it. Let's go check it out. start off with your story. I mean, how did you get to become an astronaut? I mean, that's every child's dream, right? It was my child's dream. I mean, I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. It was my childhood uh, desire, and there's not a time that I can remember that I didn't want to fly. Uh, as, a, as a kid, I was the, the one who's out there at the chain link fence at the airport watching the planes go. And I jumped off of everything. My parents had to buy me a football helmet to keep the head injuries down. When you're really young, when you're in first grade, everybody is on board. Yeah, be an astronaut kid. Yeah. Uh, and that lasts for five or six years, and then you start to hear some other things. And then eventually, by the time you're in high school, people start to say things like, you're not smart enough to be an astronaut. You're not athletic enough to be an astronaut. You don't dress well enough to be an astronaut. You're not good looking enough to be an astronaut. The fact is that somebody has to be an astronaut. Right. And so... And you knew it was going to be you. I, I knew it was going to be me. Okay, so your first flight into space. Yeah. Tell us about that. It was STS-72. Our, our mission was to uh, fly on Endeavour. Uh, pick up a Japanese satellite that had been launched eight months earlier. Bottom line is, it's your childhood dream coming true. Yeah. And it's coming true not just by yourself, but with these six best friends. You fly jets 500 miles an hour, three feet apart. You trust your life to these people. That sense of being part of a team is really, in the end, the best part of space flight. And I didn't even imagine that. Of course, the views of the Earth are, are far beyond what any camera can show. Cameras don't have the depth uh, of color or the dynamic range to show you the whiteness of the clouds against the blackness of the sky, the, the, the green of the Amazon jungle and the tan of the you know, Namibian desert. So how did your perspective of Earth change after you went out into space? I'm sure you just ha you had a different viewpoint than none of us have actually. Well, yeah, the, the ability to see the Earth from above the sky. So this sense of oneness and connectivity and, and unity uh, of the planet and the need to take care of the ecology of the planet is, you know, stands, stands out right in your face when you can see it from above the sky. The universe is so big. I mean, the solar system is so big. The galaxy, beyond the galaxy, how can we all be in this one tiny spot? So that sense of destiny, that human destiny to expand and explore and move out and become part of this galaxy. Uh, is very strong. Did you, when you were out there, did you feel like there was life out there aside from on Earth? Well, there's no way to know for sure uh, if, there's, if there's life. So the fact that it didn't take 10 billion years for life to show up on Earth, but in fact came pretty quickly, suggests that the process of life might be a, one that, that happens spontaneously and fairly fast. Right. So in the absence of data, those are the kind of things you fall back on and say, yeah, you know, probably there's life. On the other hand, where are they? Right. You know, there have been millions and billions of years for other societies to do what we plan to do. As a species, what do we plan to do? 
We plan to go to Mars. We plan to explore the, the solar system. We plan to expand into the galaxy. And if you come back in a million years and see what human beings have done, we should be all over this galaxy. We should be. And if that were the case, where is everybody else? It's a deep mystery. And I think that we need to take that to heart a little bit. We don't see anything that can stop us right now. We can do this today. Mm -hmm. We could start preparing to go to Mars and become a multi-planet species and, and, and effectively make ourselves an immortal species. Right. Because right now, one event can kill everybody on the planet. Asteroid impact, ecologic runaway. Everybody on this planet could die. But once you have an independent colony in two places on two different planets, there's no one event that can kill everybody. So the species will expand, will survive. Star Trek will happen, will go all over the galaxy. You have to force this dream to come true. So first of all, don't believe the people that tell you you can't do it. And then second of all, every day, you, you get closer to the goal, you do something to make it happen. Dan. Well, every week here on Andaz, we have great giveaways just for you. Now that we've traveled to space, you don't want to be left in the dark. Get to know who you're dealing with. Before you go into an important meeting, wouldn't it be great to be armed with the right information about that person? Know your neighbors. Curious about who your daughter is dating? We'll get a free background check at Intellius.com. Visit our website for details. Well, I hope you all enjoyed our show today and are a little bit more inspired about our future and our journey into space. And remember to like us on Facebook for great prizes and fun tips. And we'll see you next week with more great guests and inspirational stories. But before we wrap up, we get a few words from Dr. Deepak Chopra with his take on the universe. And we'll see you next week. The universe is much bigger today. It's 47 billion light years across. 70% of the universe is dark energy. 25% is dark matter. Regular atomic matter, which reflects light, absorbs light, emits light, is less than 0.1% of what's out there. What is perceived is bounced off an underlying field of consciousness as a particular perceptual experience. The real reality, as Rumi says, is behind the curtain. In truth, we are not here. This is our shadow. Love, compassion, joy, equanimity, uh, insight, intuition, inspiration, creativity, imagination. These are the raw materials of the universe. Brought to you by Unirello. Global excellence delivered to your doorstep.